are you sitting comfortably? <laughs> <laughs> then I'll begin. So um, I'm John Wire, and I'm hosting this on behalf of the Green Party and uh, delighted to uh, introduce the first of tonight's speakers, Dr. Richard Mellon-Boggis from the University of Sheffield, uh, who is going to talk to us about agrovoltaics and how agriculture and photovoltaic can be combined, which is a really interesting subject. And uh, I'm, I've been interested in it for a while and I'm looking forward to learning a lot more about it. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Richard. Following his talk, which is about half an hour, we're going to have some questions um, and then we move on to our second speaker, Mr. Chris Berry, who is the regional, sorry, Hertfordshire Planning Manager for CPRE um, and has a career background in planning. So, uh, and he's going to, well, he'll tell you what he's going to talk about when it comes to it. So, um, <laughs> Richard, over to you. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me okay? We all need to be, there's not too much feedback, or am I best with the handheld mic because there's a bit of feedback? No, or is, it, is that okay? Okay, brilliant. Right. Good evening, everybody. I'm Richard Randall Boggis, a researcher at the University of Sheffield. And for the past few years, I've been studying and researching agrovoltaics, which is combining agriculture with photovoltaics. Or putting it simply, it's integrating solar panels into agricultural land so you get the dual use of land, harmonious food and electricity production together rather than one or the other. Now, before I begin, one thing I want to make clear is that we have no commercial interest in this technology. We're purely trying to see if it can be a solution to some problems in some cases. It won't work everywhere. It won't work in all cases, in all contexts. But there could be cases where this is a better enhanced uh, option for developing solar photovoltaics compared to the status quo. And that's what we're trying to explore and to understand. Most of my research is based in East Africa, but I'll come on to that a little bit later. But firstly, why are we integrating solar panels with farming? Why are we looking into this? And this, apply, this question applies to, to, to Europe, North America, East Africa, where I'm working. This question applies everywhere. Why are we looking into agrovoltaics? Well, from a UK perspective, we need domestic food security. So government statistics state that almost half of our food is imp imported, and when you look at uh, ingredients that are used for processing food items here, that number's even higher. And we spend almost 50 billion pounds a year on importing our food. We've seen over the last few years as well the urgent need for our own domestic food security. So we need to maintain and, and boost our agricultural productivity. Local food is what we need, we all, we all know that. 71% of the UK is classified as agricultural land. So that's almost three quarters of the UK is agricultural land already. And we'll have our own opinions of what that means to us, but for many people, that's the British countryside. It's the rolling hills, it's the farmland, it's the, it's the sheep grazing. This is part of our culture, is, is our agriculture and our countryside. So we need to maintain and support local food production in a sustainable way as well, of course. On the other hand, we also need renewable electricity. The first thing we need to do is reduce our electricity consumption. Following that, we need it to come from green energy sources and low emission electricity. So electricity generation in the UK emits almost 100 million, or about 100 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent greenhouse gases. So that's 22% of our greenhouse gas emissions is coming from electricity generation but only 33% is coming from renewables. That number fluctuates depending on how, how windy it is or how sunny it is, but it's approximately 33% of our capacity is from renewables. So where's the other 66% coming from? Um, less than half percent is coming from solar. And solar is one of the, the strong, viable option for renewable electricity generation. We need more solar because we need renewable electricity. But where's that solar going to go? 
to reach, to be on target for our net, net zero goals, we, we need about five times more solar by 2035. That's the current energy strategy target. Um, where's that gonna go? It needs to go on rooftops, of course, but we also need large scale solar as well because we need that low carbon electricity generation. But one of the challenges is that obviously that could conflict with the first thing that I presented, the agricultural land. So we have a challenge here. How do we produce um, local food production in a sustainable way? And how do we have land used for renewable electricity generation that we need? And the reason behind all of this renewable electricity generation is while we can discuss what we need, what we don't need, what's political, what's not, one thing that isn't political is climate change. It is happening. My t-shirt is showing how over the last 170 years, the climate's warming. This isn't, this isn't political, this is facts. It, it proof, it's a source, my t-shirt. <laughs> For the UK, it's forecast that under a high emissions scenario, the temperature will increase between 0.7 to 4.9 degrees, possibly higher in the summer, if we don't do anything about changing our emissions. And that's by, by 2070. And I want to put something into context here. Um, I'm not familiar with how much you know about climate change, but people often say 1.5 degrees is what we're aiming for, and that 1.5 degrees doesn't sound all that much. Well, 20,000 years ago, in the last ice age, it's pretty cold, right? It's called the ice age. We've seen the film, we see how cold it is. The global temperature there was about five degrees colder than it is now. So five degrees doesn't also sound like all that much, and yet we were in an ice age. So what's it going to be like if it's, you know, global temperatures are hitting 4.5 degrees warmer than they are now? Also, think about the rate of change. And this is one thing that many people don't necessarily consider, is how quickly it's changing. So what does this mean for the UK? More unpredictable rainfall, uh, longer, more severe droughts, and in 2020, uh, heavy rainfall and periods of drought um, at different times of the year caused our wheat yields to be reduced by 40%. So climate change is affecting food production. Climate change is caused by greenhouse gas emissions. Greenhouse gas emissions are emitted when we're producing electricity. Like I said, first thing, reduce our electricity uh, consumption. But secondly, get it from clean sources. And this all, basically, this causes a challenge of conflicting goals. And, and a, couple of, a couple of decades ago, I would think about it as fossil fuel bad, renewable energy good, simple. But now we're starting to see conflicts between the sustainable development goals. There's 17 UN sustainable development goals, including things like clean energy production, um, and food security, and those things can conflict with each other as well. So this is where one potential solution is agrivoltaics. This is Westmore Solar Park in Oxfordshire. We've got large solar panels producing low carbon electricity. We need this, this is great. It's also got some wind power. Uh, it's a lot better than coal power station. But the main use of that land is renewable energy generation. This is an agrivoltaics test site, one of the first ones um, developed in Europe. This is in France, in Montpellier. And, okay, it's a bit sunnier, you can see that. It's a bit sunnier in the south of France than the UK. But these are solar panels above an agricultural plot of land. So in here, they're producing renewable energy, they're also producing food as well. There's one thing I want to quickly just address because the first thing that people say to me is, but you're shading the crops. Uh, surely that's not gonna be a good thing. I see a few people laughing, they're already thinking it as well. I'm not going to get technical about this, but that thought applies if you follow this blue line, where it's a linear relationship, more sunlight equals more plant productivity. That's not the case. Eventually, other factors start to limit food production. This, in reality, is this red line here. This will vary depending on the plant type, but essentially, you start to get to a point where more light doesn't equal more productivity. Um, and actually, in some cases, Maybe it's also relevant in the UK, but in some cases, there can be such things as too much light for plants. We know that. Too much heat, those kind of stresses as well. And so for the right crops in the right location, the partial shading of agrivoltaics can actually benefit food production. And I've got some exciting results to show you from our work on that later. Just one thing to mention is that agrivoltaics can take many forms and it's in its early days. It's in its infancy at the moment. So the, which design to use under what situation, what location, what context is still being decided at the moment. But we are moving on from the, from, sorry, from the research uh, stage to the commercial development stage now. 
in mainland Europe, in the US, and in, in large parts of Asia, particularly East Asia. So on the right, this is a research site in Germany, um, and you can see it's a very tall system. They have said to me they wouldn't design it like this anymore, so don't worry about the rather bulky looking structure. This was just a, let's get this in and test it and see how, how the crops grow. But you can see they've got combine harvester underneath, so they've actually got mechanized agriculture underneath solar panels. Very proud of this one. This is our agrivoltaic system in Kenya. It's three meters tall, and again, you can see uh, we've got cabbages and lettuces in there uh, in this photo growing underneath the partial shade of the solar panels. What we are doing in the UK already is combining um, solar panels with, with livestock. Um, so that's one, a lot of the, that 75, sorry, 71% of land that's agriculture is grazing land. And this is one potential way of integrating solar panels into agriculture. And a new technology which has currently been explored are these vertical bifacial systems where they generally generate electricity in the morning and the evening. So they've got solar panels on both sides so they can generate when the sun's on both sides. Um, and you then don't have the issues of the height restriction. One of the main thoughts on this, though, is the visual impact. And that's not really going to be uh, mitigated when you've got some, some systems like this. But again, it comes to the question of how do we uh, develop solar? Like I said, we need renewable, en renewable energy, so how, is the best, how do we best implement it? Like I said, firstly, rooftop solar is the place to go, but we need large-scale solar as well. So how do we best do that? This could be a potential option, but its electricity generation will be lower than if the panels were facing directly towards the sun. There are tracking systems where the panels will track the sun to maximize their generation, but they're, they're costly, and if you're implementing them with agrivoltaic systems, then that could increase the shading of the crops. So there's lots of things to think about with designing these systems and implementing them. Now, I was just having a conversation uh, just before this, this talk, actually, about the three pillars of sustainability environment, economy, and society. And all of those things need to be considered for something to work. And so, so one thing which often gets, if I'm honest, it, it gets a bit cast aside, is the social aspect, the community aspect. What do, lo what do local people, uh, how do they perceive this technology? Do they want it? Does it work for their interests as well? And there can be conflicting goals. Um, so there's lots of challenges for us to address. That's what we're trying to do. And like I said at the start, it would, it, this isn't a technology that we're, we're pushing, and we certainly don't want that to be the case. But we're trying to research it and understand, could this work in some cases? Could this allow us to produce low-carbon electricity, less energy coming from fossil fuels, while maintaining agricultural production? I think I've described agrivoltaics now. So here's a couple of other photos, just to show the diverse range. So uh, I'm a member of the Agrivoltaics um, Scientific Committee for the Agrivoltaics Conference Series. And I've been to the, the past conferences since it started in 2020. Uh, the first couple were obviously uh, online because of, uh, of the pandemic. And last year it was in Piacenza in Italy. And this is a system that they have there, developed by a company called Remtech. And uh, those are actually tracking solar panels. So the solar panels will move um, to face the, face the sun. Um, and then here on the right uh, is in uh, South Korea. Uh, in Daegu, and again, you can see the vertical bifacial system there, and then you've also got a raised up system, which I was very pleased to see also um, looks similar to what we've developed in, in East Africa as well. So different designs, which will work with different crop types um, and different agricultural setups, because obviously it depends on the machinery that's, that's needed as well. One of the things that I've not got a photo of, that we, which I wish I had, um, would be, say, community-based systems, say, allotments with solar panels on. So one of the wonderful things about agrivoltaics is that it addresses multiple goals, and often solutions to these individual goals can be in conflict with each other. Um, so this is a picture, again, of our system in Kenya. One thing I want to point out before I forget is that we also have rainwater harvesting as well. So we have these nice flat surfaces that this can collect rainwater that's running off it, stored in a large water tank, which can then be used for irrigation during periods of drought. And one of the things that I really like the idea of, as I've mentioned, is an allotment set up with some solar panels spaced apart above it, small solar panels, and again with water butts for collecting the rainwater for use during periods of drought. When we first started looking into this technology, it was very much about food and energy security, and it very quickly uh, became obvious that it was about water as well. 
Um, and I'm talking about this in the East African context. I think we all know that it's becoming increasingly an issue in the UK as well. It's of the land, I don't need to talk, to talk about this too much, this is pretty obvious, the, the dual use of land um, is, is one, of the, one of the big benefits of, of agrivoltaics. But of course there's a socioeconomic impacts as well. Job opportunities for implementing a new technology, um, the, the maintenance for these different uh, implementations of solar. So there's different opportunities with, with agrivoltaics as well. And of course there's the, the research aspect, there's a lot that needs to be understood. My next slide is a little bit of a crude overview, but I was just trying to get my thoughts down to compare conventional PV with, with agrivoltaics. And we need PV, it's providing low carbon electricity, we need that. With agrivoltaics, because of the slight um, change where you, the panels may need to be spaced further apart to allow more sunlight into the underlying crops, the electricity generation may be less than 100% compared to a the equivalent of a conventional ground mounted solar park. So it might produce slightly less electricity, um, and I'm just going to say now also at a higher cost, which is a problem as well, but you're maintaining that food production. And when you factor in the sale of the food underneath the solar panels, then that could actually make it more economical than just a conventional solar park. That's our, one of our biggest challenges though, because you've got different stakeholder groups involved. And so while overall the productivity of the land might be higher, who's getting those the pieces of the pie, and the farmer will be taking some from what would potentially be the solar, um, the solar developers, even if their pie themselves would be smaller. So it's a, it is a challenge in that sense with working out how this works, what business models can we use for the different stakeholder groups. It, not in all cases, but in some cases, conventional PV takes away from agricultural land, whereas we have production of food with agrivoltaics. Um, with water, it depends on the setup and where you are, but conventional solar needs water for panel cleaning, whereas with our system, with the rainwater harvesting, you integrate the, uh, the, the panel cleaning water into a water spot, and you can use that for, for irrigation. Um, so the panel cleaning and rainwater can be used. The partial shading, whether it's with the raised up systems or even the vertical bifacial systems blocking the wind of it, reduce evapotranspiration. So they're reducing water loss from the plants and from the soil. And I've got some really exciting results to show you from, from our uh, experiments there as well. I mentioned that, and, and I mentioned socioeconomics as well. Both of them provide uh, jobs and income, but a big challenge with conventional PV is that you've got sector conflicts because you've got energy developers wanting farmland for producing energy. You've got, you've got farmers and potentially local communities wanting farmland for food production, whereas agriculture takes a cross-sectoral. Um, Potential new markets for solar developers, that's another aspect as well, is that there could be land which isn't available because the community don't want to lose their farmland. If the solar developers um, design their solar systems to be integrated with the farmland, then it could be a market that they can enter. But again, that won't apply everywhere. And what I'm certainly not saying is that this, this technology should go everywhere. That's not what I'm saying, but it could go in some places, and that's what we want to understand. And as I mentioned, there's the the higher cost aspect. So how an agrivoltaic system performs in terms of its electricity generation, its food production, its water conservation, etc., depends on a range of factors, which I've tried to summarize with these graphics here. Of course, the amount of sun, that's a, that's a pretty obvious one. The temperature as well. Higher temperatures reduce the efficiency of solar panels. Not so much of an issue here. But that is a case in many parts of the world where actually solar panels, photovoltaics, get too hot and then they produce less electricity. If you raise the system up and you have crops underneath, you have more headspace and more airflow, and you've got plants transpiring, so releasing water underneath, and that can cool the panels down and increase their generation efficiency. The amount of rainfall is an important one as well. One of the biggest ones is the crop type. Some crops need the sun, they love the sun, and as I showed you in that graph earlier, that plateau will happen this way up there with sunlight. They love the sun. Some crops really like to be in the shade, and they don't like direct sunlight. And so having the partial shade from solar panels can allow you to grow those, those uh, shade-tolerant crops. And in fact, in some places, if the environment is suitable for certain crops at, say, one time of the year, but then it starts to get, say, too hot, or perhaps... Uh, uh, if there's, there's hailstorms, for example, as we've seen in, uh, in some studies in the Netherlands, 
then having these, these, this partial shading can protect the crops from, from that and extend growing seasons or extend areas where crops can be grown as well. And these final few are just showing, it depends if there's a need for the electricity. Um, there's no point in building a, a solar park or an agrovoltaic system where there's nowhere to connect it or it's, it's, it can't be connected to the grid or in the case of East Africa, there's, there's not an off-grid community that needs it. Um, is there a market for the system? And a particularly challenging one, is what's the, what are the regulations, the planning commissions, and the, and the, the policies to support this technology? Because at the moment, it's generally split between different policies for, for agriculture and for um, electricity or for solar development. So what policies can support agriculture development? So at the moment, there's a lot of research going on around the world. This has really cropped up over the last decade. Um, and the idea was first mentioned actually in the early 80s um, by the founder of Fraunhofer IC in Germany, the Institute for Sustainable Energy. And uh, it, that was in the early 80s when he first proposed it in a paper. And then it didn't go anywhere for a couple of decades. Then Japan started developing a lot of agrovoltaic systems uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, but it wasn't really shared wi widely um, and in the academic and research literature either. Um, but it was starting to happen a lot in, in Japan. Uh, there's a lot of work in China as well. And then in 2011 and 2013, some fantastic papers came out from France, uh, from a guy called Christian Duprat. And uh, that was really kind of like laying the, showing that it can be done in, in Europe. And since then, we've got projects in France, across the different parts of France, in Italy, in Germany, in the Netherlands, and we're, there's a system that's now, there's a research group now looking into agrovoltaics in Sweden. So we're really starting to show um, a range of climates here that it's been implemented in. And there's a lot of work in, in the US uh, as well. Um, and here, this is where our system is in, in East Africa. One of the big questions though, is what about the UK? Um, and I'll come on to that more a bit later. I'm just gonna quickly go through some of the findings from our system, uh, our two systems in East Africa. So we've got one in Kenya and one in Tanzania, and I'm just gonna talk for some of the results that we've had from Tanzania, um, just because they're pretty exciting and show what this technology can, can do. Um, and I mean, I love these photos. So here you've got the agrovoltaic system, and this is our control plot next to it, where we compare the productivity. Um, and you can see we've got, this is really surprising, we've got wheat growing underneath it productively. Uh, and I love this photo. So you've got a Swiss chart looking really happy, really healthy underneath the solar panels. It told me it was happy, so uh, I'm, I'm pleased about that. <laughs> so we've got the photos, we've got the farmers tell us. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail with data and graphs, but one of the things I do just want to show, if you just look above the graphs, you can see that some yields have increased quite substantially and some decreased. This isn't a silver bullet. It's not going to work for every crop everywhere. I think I've, I've, I've uh, made that clear. Um, and the reason I say that is because some, some people sometimes come up with an idea like, ah, well, it won't work with this, therefore the whole idea is shut down. That's not the case. Um, and you can see that with crops that it has worked, worked well with. We were really surprised by maize, because maize is one of those crops which, as I mentioned, is sun-loving, but it was growing underneath the shade of our, our solar panels, and actually it had a higher yield compared to the control. These are some really big increases. The Swiss chard, the part of the, the plant that you harvest is the leaf. And one response of some plants to shade is to grow bigger leaves to try and capture more sunlight. So if the, the leaf is what you harvest for your crop, uh, brilliant. The, if you've got a higher yield from a plant trying to grow, grow uh, bigger leaves to capture it, then that's fantastic. Next question, what's the nutrient content? Is it putting, those re is it putting fewer resources, uh, nutrients into the leaf so it's growing in size but it's not as nutritious? Um, that's, an, that's the next question that we want to ask. The beans is a really interesting one, which I'll talk about in a moment, actually. The first thing I want to mention before the beans is that we had this reduction in yield of onion and sweet pepper. That's not a failure. What we're doing here is we're producing food underneath the solar panels. It might not be as much compared to an open field system, but we are producing food underneath the solar panels, so this isn't considered a failure. And in fact, when you look at the finance aspect of it, the onion and sweet pepper um, this might not be the best way of presenting our caps. I should have kept it in order. I've done it in, in uh, order of, uh, pr well, in this case, going down in value. Um, the most valuable with the onions and the sweet pepper, even though they had yield reductions compared to the control, 
they're still valuable crops. And again, that's kind of just highlighting the fact that um, it, it, you know, it's, it's still working with those crops. On to the beans. They're not very, they're, they're, they're right down here at the end. The reason being, there was a longer period um, of, of high temperatures when, in this growing season. Longer period of high temperatures, is that? Does that sound like familiar to anybody? And what we found is more than half of the plants died off in the control plot, but it was 37% fewer plants died off in the control. So only 39% died off there, so there's a 37% difference there, um, which kind of indicates that there could be potential for climate change resilience. If we're going to see longer periods of, of high temperatures or droughts, could this partial shading protect crops from that? And in fact, one of the studies which I think is really good for this is the one in, in the Netherlands with, with raspberries, because the raspberries were growing fine uh, in the control as well as their roll system. Then a hailstorm wiped out a load of the, 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 the soft fruit berries in the open field system, whereas the, the, the solar panels protected them. So even if uh, in, in most conditions you might see a slight reduction in yield under the solar panels, you could be uh, resistant or resilient to um, potential climate shocks as well. So it's worked, fantastic, and it's also worked with less water. So we've needed less irrigation for, for our system here. So this is part of the farm's centralized irrigation system, and then we have our rainwater harvesting tank. That 3.4%, that's not all of we produce, that's just how much they've used. So I, I don't know how much water's in that tank, but um, that's how much they've used so far. Um, but this is fantastic as well, because basically, we, I mean, if you think about some of those crops, the, the, um, the maize and the, the beans, we're, we're growing those in the Swiss chard, we're, we're growing those with less water and resulting with higher yields. Last, last graph that I'm showing um, is soil moisture content. It's a bit of an obvious one, um, but I kind of like it because of that. Um, the soil is driest in the control plot, and then we measured the soil underneath the gap, like directly underneath a, um, a gap between the solar panels, um, and that's this middle one here with the soil moisture content, and then the soil was, was wettest underneath the shade. Um, it's a bit of a, 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 you know, an expected finding, but it's just nice to actually have some, some data to, to back it up, um, and also a cool photo. Um, fantastic team in Tanzania, they get quite arty when they take the photo, so I don't have to rotate them around. <laughs> So the final thing from the results that I want to show that I'm almost finished is one of the ways of quantifying um, the productivity of the land is called a land equivalent ratio. And it's a very simple approach. You take what's your open field and that sets your, your baseline for your food production. Uh, so that sets it as, as one. You have your conventional solar and that sets that as one. I don't know if you can see there's a one there. Oh no, sorry, there's the other one there. Um, so that's your conventional solar, which is your baseline. So both of those, then baseline is set at one. When you look at agrivoltaics, you have a slight reduction in energy production because the panels are more spaced apart than if you were to have them as a conventional system. Um, the food productivity is slightly higher with the results that we've, we've found um, on average. Of course, it could even be slightly lower. When you combine them together, you're getting more productivity from that land. So if you take one unit area of land, the, the production is higher. So in summary of, of the work that we've found so far, we're producing low carbon electricity for the farms in Kenya and Tanzania. Um, both of them are using less water to irrigate the, prop, the crops underneath the solar panels. They're both producing food, which is fantastic. Um, of course, they're the dual use of land. Uh, and I mentioned the potential socioeconomic benefits. In, the, in our case, with our research in East Africa, it's the fact that the system in Kenya is connected to the grid, and we're reducing their energy bills by about $550 a month. So um, that's for a grid-type system. The system in Tanzania is actually off-grid, so we're providing electricity to a, um, to a farming training center which didn't have electricity provision before. It just had a couple of solar panels on the roof, um, and now they've got um, a much bigger provision, so they've actually managed to ex expand their, their teaching capabilities with that. So last thing I want to mention is some work that we're currently conducting. Um, which is, so underneath there you can't see it, it says research in progress. This is the potential for agrivoltaics to alleviate food versus fuel land use conflicts in Great Britain. 
I'm not sure if that's a title that I will use because I don't know if I want to approach it as, as land use conflicts yet. Um, I'm trying to think of it as, as, as the positive ways. It's an energy and food production in harmony together. But what we're doing here is modeling a range of different um, uh, factors which will, will influence uh, the um, location of agrivoltaics. So the, the slope of the land, distance to grid connection, uh, the land use. Um, and in our case, we're, we're using agricultural grades of land as a proxy for agricultural production. So high-grade agriculture, or land that's designated as high-grade agriculture, is likely to be the most productive. So that's actually where we're saying would be the most potential for agrivoltaics, because then that partial shading is less likely to have significant downsides to the food production. So you're maintaining the agricultural land, but you have all of the environmental factors, the soil type, etc., which support um, healthy agricultural productivity. Um, and you can't quite see it with the screen, but there's quite a, well, there's a gradient of the colours here, which isn't that surprising either, to show where it would be most, most suitable. But basically, flat, sunny farmland could work well. There is actually, there has been construction of an agrivoltaic system in the UK. It was for my birthday. Um, so um, next I'd like to make a slightly bigger one that actually produces electricity. Um, but uh, yeah, this is from a good friend of mine for a birthday present, which is probably one of the best presents I've ever had. And so that's the end of my talk. Um, and I have got a video to show you. Um, I've got a backup video from our system in East Africa, but actually I found this one online. I know Jack Solar Garden. I know Greg Baron Gafford, one of the researchers at the University of Arizona, who's um, contributing to the research here. And they're really leading the way with a lot of agrivoltaics research. There isn't anything like this for the UK, so I'm presenting what there is in Colorado, but hopefully it'll give you a good um, perception or perspective of what agrivoltaics can look like and some of the factors behind it. And I think basically in four and a half minutes, they're going to sum up what I've been rambling on about for the last half an hour. My understanding is society only has two things. We have our people and we have our land. When we develop solar arrays, we need to keep our land functional because that's part of our society. Traditional solar installations, the land is a detriment because it potentially can grow vegetation that might shade the solar panels. And if it shades the panels, then that's less electricity it produces. So they hire people to go in and mow it or spray that land and keep that land degraded over time. A different way of doing it is by elevating the panels so that you can have solar above agriculture. Agrivoltaics is agriculture and photovoltaics smashed together to make agrivoltaics. The solar panels provide that shade, that microclimate for crops to be able to grow in, and it makes it easier for people to be within that space or for tractors to be within that space. Agrivoltaics has so many wins involved with it. We are seeing a mutually beneficial relationship between the solar panels and the vegetation. As temperatures get too hot, many plants shut down their photosynthetic activities throughout the middle part of the day. The partial shade from the panels allows that photosynthesis to continue occurring throughout the growing day. The plants actually create a cooler microclimate underneath the panels. That cooler microclimate creates higher efficiencies and higher output. The cooler conditions underneath the panels lead to less evaporation of water from the soil. That allows us to reduce the amount of supplemental water we give for irrigation, which in some cases could be half as much water to achieve the same yields. So what this means is that instead of vegetation serving as a barrier to solar development, it actually can lead to lower O&M costs for managing, as well as higher panel efficiencies leading to more clean energy production. Jack Solar Garden is the largest commercial research site for agrivoltaics in the U.S. 3,276 panels producing enough clean energy for about 300 homes in our area. We're growing at least 15 different varieties of crops. Everything from salad greens to cooking greens to root veggies. We were really excited to make use of the space under the solar panels because it has historically just been sitting there unused and to be able to work in the shade in the middle of the day. <laughs> I think that that could have really long-term benefits for farm worker health. We feel like there's so many benefits. 
reduced water, the plants will do better because of the microclimate created by the panels. The farmers have a better time because they're not in the sun all day. That we're using the land for food production instead of it just sitting there baked in. And it'll all be funneled back to the local community, including donations to food pantries, CSA programs, and also some farmers markets. It might be win, win, win. <laughs> We want to show our community that there's a different way that we can have solar energy being produced across our country. That it doesn't have to be how it's always been. The potential is boundless everywhere people live. They need energy and they need food. The insights we're gaining here will inform development not only in Colorado, but also throughout the country and throughout the world. We need bigger change. We need it from our policymakers. We need it from the solar developers. We need it from landowners. My understanding is society only has two things. We have our people and we have our land. When we develop solar arrays, to the section that I'm actually most excited about to be here today, and I mean that sincerely, is to hear your thoughts and your, your questions and your comments on this technology with a local perspective. So, so thinking of your, your, your uh, local context and, and the area around you and the challenges that you're facing, uh, what do you think about this, this technology? There's no right or wrong answer with this either. Um, so, and also, I mean, if you have broader questions about what we're doing in, in East Africa or generally agrivoltaics around the world, feel free to ask those questions as well. But for me, I'm particularly interested to hear what you think about it as well. So, thank you very much. So, anybody got any questions? Two hands, one here, and one at the back. Okay, two. Hi. Um, actually, I don't think either of my two sneaky questions are anything to do with what you latterly said, which is anything to do with local. It's more from an engineering perspective. One thing we've got a lot of in the UK is wind. And ground mount conventional PV farms, um, the wind loading factors are pretty well understood. Once you elevate that by five, six metres, does that mean that the solar panels are non-standard? Obviously, the ground anchors are are going to be different and also um, do we have any idea whether the embodied carbon involved in the build of an agrivoltaics is going to be significantly different from a conventional solar farm? Thank you very much. Those are two fantastic questions. Um, in short the answer is yes and yes. So uh, yes the system raised up will um, need to be engineered to account for the higher um, for, for wind loads um, but, but that's an engineering problem and engineering solution that can be done. These systems have been developed in places much windier than, than the UK, so it can be done. It just needs to be engineered and designed for that. Um, and in terms of the embodied carbon, yes, uh, there's more steel. The systems have more steel in them to raise them up or whatever material is used, and um, so there is more embedded carbon in the system. And that's why one of the most important things to do is conduct a life cycle assessment or an LCA um, to understand what are the environmental impacts of these because the embedded carbon is going to be greater than a conventional ground mounted solar park. Is it therefore environmentally worth having the plants underneath um, as well? I mean, the plants will be taking up carbon, so you have to do, um, do, to do the uh, calculations for that. We haven't yet done that for the UK. Um, there have been studies in, um, I can't remember where they were based, but it's a research group in Austria who've looked into life cycle assessments of different agrivoltaic systems. Um, 
one of the main results that they found was actually compared to raised light voltaics and um, conventional ground mounted solar was that the vertical bifacial systems have the lowest um, embedded carbon because you've got much less uh, steel in the mountain structure. But that's certainly something that needs to be considered. And actually one of the things I think needs to be researched more is sustainable mountain structure designs, both for agrivoltaics and also conventional PV. So yeah, that's a fantastic question. Thank you. Can I just ask, when you ask a question, if you've got any particular background? So as you might have guessed, Rod has a background in <laughs> electrical engineering. <laughs> but if you've got any particular background or interest, reason why you're asking the question, and also your name when you ask a question. Thanks. My name is Diane Kennedy. My interest is we're about to have in our ancient hamlet on the outskirts of this town we are going to have a large solar farm. You mentioned three pillars. The third one was society. I hope society is not going to be at the bottom of your pillars because society is extremely important where these solar farms are built, whether they're as tall as that or low, as they are mainly here, without the amount of crops being grown. Society that are having to deal with very strong-minded developers out to make their money with the farmer on wonderful agricultural land in our case. Society wasn't consulted. We suddenly knew of this large solar farm and to fight these men is virtually impossible. It is on our doorstep. It's horseshoe shaped so it surrounds our village. We're we don't have pavements in our village. We walk the footpaths for our mental health and arriving at another spot in Hertfordshire. The Hertfordshire Way is a wonderful footpath used from people coming out from London as well as locals. We now have this solar farm on our doorstep. We're told that the footpaths can stay. Who will want to walk? amongst thousands and thousands of those panels. I don't think so. I personally have to look out onto this site from every window of my cottage. The solar farm is on elevated land. Why can't it be on flat land? My cottage is on elevated land. I see this. This is what I'll see for the end of my days. We weren't consulted. That can't be right. It, it's not right. It, you should be consulted. And actually, when you say um, hoping that society isn't at the bottom of the pillars, so the three pillars, and they're all next to each other. Um, it, it's the way that it was actually introduced to me um, during my master's degree was by my course director. She described to me as a three three legged stool. Any one of those legs is missing, then it falls down. So you should have been consulted. The community should be consulted. Of course, we should. And every single photograph you show tonight, there's no housing. What was is anybody going to be conflicted from their windows or are they many miles? I know Colorado, I have walked. It's a large piece of land. I don't think there's anybody on the doorsteps. I think we are in this tiny island. Yeah, it's, Agricultural it's, land and green belt is important to people mm -hmm. and it should be part of the scenario of these buildings, of these many, many houses. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, it should be. I completely agree with you. Um, and that's why I was saying that in, in my first example of the context was that the culture of the food section was the British countryside. It's like you're, like you're describing. Going for walks is good for your mental health. Greenery is good. I mean, one of the things I'm most interested in is, is, na is basically the, um, I don't want to say natural capital because I don't like that term because it's adding the economic aspect of it. But essentially ecosystem services, the benefits of being out in nature, the benefits that nature provides to us as a society, um, and the benefits that greenery and green spaces has for both our environment, our ecosystems, and our mental health. So you should be consulted, and these systems need to be developed um, with the local community, not just in mind, but at the forefront. And so that I completely agree with. And that's why it's a challenge of how do we develop this, because everything that you're, you've just said is very well said, and. Uh, it's a perfect representation of some of the challenges, but we do also need to implement renewable energy as well. It could be that there are actually better locations than around your hamlet, 
and the reason that those better, like say, let's say technically better locations may not have been developed because it might have cost more, that's not how it should be. Exactly. That, and, uh, we're, we're near to the grid, so that's our downfall. Yeah, exactly. And, and that I completely agree with. And um, I think that we shouldn't be. Well, I'm, I'm here to not get too political, um, <laughs> but let's just say I agree. It with should you. be part of I, the scenario. I'd like, yeah. to, I'd like to give some other questioners a chance, if that's okay. So there's a gentleman at the front here who had his hand up, and after that, Val in the front as well. Your name? Hello, uh, my name is David. My background is main, mainly out of interest in, in the area. I do some cultural literacy training, and I'm also working careers guidance up in Cambridge, where coincidentally my office has um, orange transparent windows, which also act for solar panels. So. Um, Popping up everywhere, but my question was about. Um, I mean, this may be something you just don't have the data on, in which case, very short answer. Um, but I was wondering if you have any information on if we have, say, a hectare or an acre of um, agrovoltaic land compared to the same amount of land where those solar panels are on the roofs of houses. Do you have any information about the uh, equivalence of efficiency? I, I don't know the equivalent efficiency. Um, but essentially, if you're talking about the same capacity solar panels mounted on the ground as opposed to mounted on, on rooftops, then the main difference would be a slight change in the albedo or the, 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 the solar radiation reflection from the rooftop versus, let's say, vegetated ground underneath. And then if you've got the transpiring plants as well, they might be slightly cooler. But I think the effect on the efficiency is going to be quite negligible if you've got the same capacity. So if you're, say, comparing um, a 50 kilowatt system on the ground versus 50 kilowatts on rooftop. Um, but I don't, I don't know that for sure. So there could be a difference, but I wouldn't suspect it would be that different apart from the albedo of the um, effect of the temperature of the panels. Okay. And, and do you know, um, remember, would you have the same on, on net production? Do you, would you know anything about that in terms of sort of, or, or maybe even number of solar panels on equivalent houses versus agri voltaics? So, do you mean with the fact that, so with agrovoltaics or with conventional, so you can have the panels much more dense in terms yeah. of close together, whereas on rooftop, I mean, it depends on the size of the houses and the size of the rooftop, how many yeah. people are, are taking them up. Um, so there's too, there's too many factors that would affect that okay. to give it a, a quantified number. What I would say is we need to be looking at rooftop solar as well. And that's one thing, again, I want to really reiterate, this isn't like the answer, mm -hmm. and it won't work everywhere. Um, but it's, it's one of many things that we need. Um, we need wind power as well because we're a windy island. Um, and yeah, and then we need rooftop solar as well. We need those building integrated photovoltaics too. So the semi-transparent solar panels on windows um, as well. So we need a lot of solutions to try and address this. Yeah. Thank you. The t-shirt, not me, by the way. Val in the front here. Okay. Uh, Val Fry, I'm Did, did you want to wait for the mic? I know you've got a great voice, but... <laughs> I can usually manage it. Um, I'm Val Bryant, one of the district councillors. I'm here for personal interest. I was very interested in the comment that you made about uh, there being uh, more benefits on good agricultural land. Does that work for, I think, areas around here where we're growing wheat, barley, beans, etc.? So I suspect that wheat here, the, um, there's a couple of challenges. So firstly, wheat is a sun-loving crop, so I suspect the partial shade would have a, um, a reduction in the yield. But how much is reduced um, will determine whether it's, a, again, like a failure or not. If it's, say, like a 50%, 60% reduction in yield, then it's probably not worth doing it. If it's maybe a 10% reduction, then you want to think about that 10% reduction more as a 90% production, if that makes, makes sense. So it could work. Um, we need to do the research on, on the different crop types. On beans could work um, as well. So, and one of the other advantages is that um, the, 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 with the beans you need slightly, slightly um, shorter um, mechanised agriculture. So you need, basically you need big tracks and combine harvesters for wheat. Um, so the system has to be designed to account for that. Um, so it depends on, on the crop type. Uh, it could potentially work here. And again, like I said, it might be slight reductions in yield, it may be increases in yield if uh, we're going through periods of drought. Like, like I said, in 2020, we had a major uh, loss of, of wheat because of the adverse environmental conditions. So if the partial shading can reduce that loss, if that makes sense, then 
uh, that could actually be beneficial as well. We just haven't got the data for here. Most of what we're doing is basing it on data in Europe where the environment's slightly different. Um, it's still a good indication, but what I really want, like I said, is to go from my Lego to an actual agrivoltaic pilot system in the UK where we can test the different designs on different crop types. Um, we're really in early days with this, but there's a lot of potential for it. So um, it, it basically it could be, but we don't have the data to support it yet. I, I have uh, a question for you actually, which is that we are in the process in this country of moving from one type of uh, agricultural payment system to another, and we're in a transition period. So as we came out of the EU, we moved from uh, payments, subsidies for food production uh, to we're now in a transition period and moving towards subsidies for what are determined as public good, which basically means ecosystem services, as you said. So ways in which uh, water, soil, air, you know, biodiversity, things like that, and social good as well, um, which goes to one of the, the things that the first question or the second question was. So how do you think that, uh, uh, and this is a really significant sea change in the way that, that farmers are supported, uh, how do you think this might affect agrovoltaics uh, in the future? So the important thing that you're, you're touching on here is the, the need to engage with policy makers and see how this is included with those payments to farmers. And if it's a case that, say, well, farmers would maintain their income from the land firstly if they're producing food rather than just renting it out to, um, to solar developers. So that's another aspect of it, is, is what the business model is going to, to look like and will these policies for the payments to farmers um, for public good, like you say, include uh, agrivoltaics? Um, there isn't really anything about agrivoltaics yet in, in policy and regulation because it's such a new technology and it's not been evidenced yet in the UK. Um, so when it comes to biodiversity, um, having wildflower meadows, um, you know, features in the, in the land and the land management to promote biodiversity and habitat conservation, there can be payments for, um, for those features. But in terms of actually just maintaining it as agricultural land, I'm not quite sure how that would look at the moment. And that's why one of the important things to do is first communicate this idea, share this idea with policymakers. And it's an ongoing process at the moment, but that's something we need to do is, is see if it would be included with that. Several, several hands up. <laughs> um, th these two ladies here were, were, were first and then... Okay. Um, hi, my name is Kamal, I'm a master's student in journalism, and this is more of like an international question, but um, so obviously it's quite expensive to create, you know, farms and stuff, but um, you know, in developing countries, you know, you work in East Africa, and I was in Nepal recently, and they have a huge food insecurity problem there, how, like, how long would it take to allow these countries to be able to fund it themselves and become independent in running these farms because you know they're the ones that are being most affected and you know a lot of our crops come from there too so how will that work and how long would it take? I mean, that's a really interesting question it's a huge challenge so um, I, I'm not sure for Nepal I know there are a lot of agriculture research projects um, in, in India um, and from our work in East Africa what we know is that a lot of energy developments um, rely on external funding, so donor funding, NGOs, um, international government funding. So the big cost of setting up these, uh, these agrivoltaics farms is the upfront cost for the capital to install the system. Um, and so that's one of the biggest um, challenges. And our, our project, I should mention, was funded by what's now finished with the UK GCRF, the Global Challenges Research Fund. Um, and funded this research and the, the purpose of it is to understand the potential livelihood benefits but what we're also doing as part of this research is understanding how can these systems be uptaken by local communities and local businesses and um, ultimately that's a real challenge because they are expensive and, and a big question is it actually comes down to where does the money come from and what financial systems or credit systems or loan systems can be put in place um, to support their development which aren't exploiting the local as well, because that's another big issue um, with this. 
and I've spoken to a lot of very good solar developers that really have the renewable energy objective in mind. I've also spoken to solar developers that are just looking to exploit a place for their own profit. Um, so uh, how can this be managed essentially? Um, and it is a challenge because they are expensive. Um, so in terms of the time scale, I, I can't answer that question, I'm afraid, or else I'd be a, probably have a Nobel Prize in economics. Uh, we'll just take, I think time is moving on, we'll take a couple more questions. And I think my question has been partly answered. Um, I was also going to ask sort of, or make a comment around the social justice issues around this. So my name is Marilla um, from Letchworth. Um, I'm with Global Justice Now and some other groups as well. And I'm doing a master's in sustainability. Um, my comments were that um, whenever new technologies um, have been produced, especially ones used in agriculture, that have to be manufactured by corporations. There's, especially in the developing world, but actually everywhere, um, farmers can be exploited and locked into contracts, you know, sometimes that don't end up being profitable for them. Um, and with a technology that's as technical as solar panels, I can imagine scenarios where potentially people put their savings into it, they're paying it off, and then maybe the solar panels stop functioning, and they're sort of told, well, we're not supporting this anymore. And so I think keeping an eye on the model by which they're implemented is so important and looks like it could be used for real social good. And you gave examples of self-sufficient communities using them who weren't even on the grid. And it looks like it can be used also with really um, diverse, almost agroecological farming methods, or also with more um, monocultures with combined harvesters underneath. Um, so I'm not sure if that's really a question, but one social justice issue that ha hasn't really been mentioned is just um, in the production of the solar panels themselves. Obviously, there's a need for precious metals and so on, and there are issues around the mining of that around the world and the pollution and social justice issues in those communities, the health issues that come up. So <coughs> I think all of that has to also be borne in mind when we're talking about the, um, pro the productivity and um, the gains. Yeah, absolutely. Th thank you very much. And that, that's a, those are some wonderful comments as well. And they really address some, some important issues. And just one thing that I want to mention, you mentioned about, say, like the, the heavy metals that are used um, for, for the manufacturing. The approach that we're taking is that it's, we're almost comparing it to either conventional um, solar panels or agrivoltaics. So either way the panels are being manufactured, how do we best implement them? Um, there's so many difficult, conflicting issues with addressing sustainable development goals. So what's the alternative? If we don't manufacture the panels, where does our electricity come from? Um, and if we say it comes from wind, then there's the manufacturing of, of wind. How do we store it? It comes from the, the, the mining for the li lithium for the batteries, depending on the battery technology. There's all sorts of conflicts and challenges. And I guess, really, at the bottom of everything, it's just about doing the least bad option, in a way. Or how can we optimize things to be as least negative, or as little negative as, as possible? Um, so that's what we're trying to, to do with this. There's no silver bullet. There's nothing which is like, absolutely right in all ways. Everything has some kind of environmental impact in some way. So it's just about trying to do, do the best thing possible. And just one other really quick comment is, is that also different people have different goals and different objectives. There's no right answer. Um, what's important to some people will be different to what other people want from, from sustainable development initiatives as well, um, which makes it very exciting. <laughs> We will have time for some more questions at the end. Uh, with what, we'll take one more now if it's brief. No, it's on the brutal commerciality of it all in the UK, really. So, if the capital cost to build it is higher by a significant amount and uh, it's less efficient for a given uh, size, therefore the return on investment must be longer, uh, or, or you need more land. Uh, so it's the kind of what's the commercial model at the tipping point uh, to make it viable for a developer to be able to, to be able to actually do it, and sort of, sort of linked with that is for the for, for a farmer as well who, on a dense uh, ground mounted PV field, is potentially going to get quite a lot of money, and then a, a, a quite a lot of money for a maintenance grant to just keep things sprayed and low. That's a lot less work than selling it 
for lower capital costs or like lower capital investment to start so, with. So can you summarise the question? I'm, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> how, how do you become commercially affordable? Yeah, at scale. No, yeah, so I get the question. It's, I've, I've discussed it with a few different energy developers um, and the, their main interest, because it does cost more, so it does have a longer payback period. Uh, one thing I will mention is that you do all, then also, there aren't business models yet for the UK, but you could think about things such as how much does a solar developer pay for the land um, to, to lease the land for their solar park, and could they come to an agreement with the landowner where they pay less so their lease is reduced? So they pay more to build the system, but they're paying less in their lease price because the land is still being used for its traditional agricultural purposes. So that's one approach. Um, then, like I said, we don't have the business models yet. This is something we need to look into. And when I have spoken with energy developers, I, it's either been a, we're going to have a slight reduction in profit, so we're not interested, or, okay, actually, we're facing some bad PR, so, um, and we're having sites that we want to build on, but we can't because the local community um, are rejecting it. And perhaps their issue isn't the visual aspect, but their issue is the loss of agricultural land. So if we maintain that agricultural land, then we could build a system there. Okay, it might be a slightly lower um, profit compared to elsewhere, but it's, it's that or nothing on that piece of land. So um, there, the, it, there's no answer yet for the business models, both for that and also for, for the international um, developments as well. Uh, that's one of the key questions, is how can this actually work for the different stakeholder groups involved and within the existing economic models. So, so one could summarize almost the answers to almost all the questions need the element that we need more research um, in, in cool temperate, in, in UK-like climates in order yeah. to really understand how this works. That's the, that's the, the big takeaway, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. My Lego model isn't giving enough data. So <laughs> having pilot systems here, and one of the things I'd really like to do um, is actually have a, a study where I can interview stakeholders from around the UK and get their different stakeholder groups and get their perspectives of this technology so that we can then start to you know, have an informed view of what the design would look like. And that would be speaking with both local communities as well as energy developers and farmers. Um, it's just a case, from my perspective, it's just a case of securing the funding. And I see research sites like the one in, in South Korea where they have multiple different designs and multiple different crops. And I know that they're doing projects in, in Germany and Italy and France and Sweden and the Netherlands. And we're not doing it yet in the UK, but we have big land use issues. So what I really want to do is, is, is have a pilot study somewhere where we can then research these systems to understand them better. So if everyone's got a big wad of cash lying around and they want to put into research, you know, let me know. Like I said, I don't have commercial interests, I do have research interests. So thank you, Richard. That was wonderful. <laughs>
And I contacted CPREH to volunteer when I moved into the county from the smoke about two or three years ago. And the trustees said their planning manager had just resigned and would I like the job. And I thought as a chief planner that wasn't necessarily a bad mix, a reasonable thing to do. Um, and so um, I've had a mixed career in the planning business, both in the UK and overseas. Um, took a few years out to do a bit of politics, um, but I didn't win, although the next guy who came into the seat did. So of course I did all the work um, and he got the seat. But I returned to planning as an interim chief planner um, and um, did that for about 15 years or so, in fact. Um, and the pandemic instituted, as I think instigated what it did for a lot of people, I think, a personal review. Um, and I made the decision to capitalize on a place in London, move out to be near my eldest daughter and her family in Letchworth. Just as much her decision to me as mine, to be honest. But um, I'm now ensconced in Central Stevenage and enjoying the 20 minute train ride to King's Cross as much as the beautiful Hertfordshire countryside that we're here to protect. And I give you this context and apologies for the rather rambling start, but as a planner in government, you're generally required or are expected to be balanced and objective. As planning manager at CPRE Hearts, I'm finally off the leash. It's a liberation indeed. I can now be as rude as I like to all those grasping developers whose proposals I used to have to entertain as somehow being more beneficial than them just making absolutely as much money as possible from the cheapest possible development in the most damaging locations. Yeah. I exaggerate slightly <laughs> the dramatic effect, but not by much, to be honest. And I'm grateful to CPREH for giving me the opportunity of this liberation. So I'm going to abuse my position, if I may, for two or three minutes to say something about CPREH, because CPREH, um, CPRE as an institution, because it's, it's, but it's actually 41 institutions to set the context, because despite appearances to the contrary, CPRE has a highly respectable and well-connected foundation with strong links to government at all levels. CPRE a Countryside Charity was actually established as the Council for the Preservation of Rural England in 1928, and a clue to its respectability is in the word council, set up by the then president of the Royal Institute of British Architects, at the same time as the growth of the Garden Cities movement, obviously, and the earliest days of the planning system as we know it. And it was seen as a council of people who had related interests and often high positions in other organizations, with an overarching purpose to preserve the countryside which was seen as under increasing threat after the Great War, when seemingly uncontrolled development was mushrooming in many of the wrong places. The county of my birth, um, Peacehaven, East Dean on the South Downs, grew like Topsy, and close to the home, ribbon development along the Great North Road, the explosion of the North London suburbs, and so on and so on. The calls came out, something must be done, and CPRE was born. Politically, the time was pretty interesting. Is there ever a time when politically things aren't interesting? My favorite story, though, is of the 1929 general election campaign, when the three candidates for prime minister, one Ramsay MacDonald, Stanley Baldwin, and David Lloyd George, all signed a letter to the Times, supporting the aims and objectives of the council. Can we imagine our three party leaders agreeing on drawing breath, let alone anything else? I think what that demonstrates, though, is that CPRE had influence in high places from the early days. And jumping ahead, this influence was instrumental in setting up the statutory planning process, finally established, of course, in its present form by the 1947 Town and Country Planning Act. And the crowning achievement um, was, and possibly remains, the establishment of national parks, areas of outstanding natural beauty, um, and the Greenbelt, land designated as open countryside one of whose characteristics <coughs> is still, to quote, the 2021 revision of the National Planning, Planning Policy Framework, its permanence, but we might return to that. Life moves on, and the council became the campaign, reflecting the fact that the statutory responsibility for land use planning since 1948 has been actual local governments, local planning authorities, under guidance, heavy-handed guidance from our central government naturally within our excessively centralized political system. Inevitably also, local CPREs were formed all over the country, and that's where we get the 40 from. We're all county organizations, and we're all autonomous 
um, charities in our own right, and we have a national office which does central government lobbying and national campaigns. So jumping many years of development and successful campaigns, we became the campaign for the protection of rural England, as opposed to the preservation, and now in the last five years, just CPRE, the countryside charity, with the county name after it. What do we do? Mainly planning. The statutory town and country planning process. And we're the only environmental charity that does that amongst the fine body of institutions like Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, RSPB, the Woodland Trust, and so on. We interact, interact directly and regularly with what a legal friend described to me as the murky bits of planning. We respond directly to planning applications, local plans consultations, planning appeals and inquiries to sharp end, if you like, but from within the process, and that's the key. It's inevitably political, with a small p. We attempt to influence planning decisions, first by responding to planning officers with letters of objection, or support, sometimes, and then by contract contacting councillors and MPs where we believe that is appropriate on applications and during the local plan process. That's a major undertaking in Hertfordshire, as I'm sure you all know. Certain amount of turmoil over borough and district local plans in this county. At various stages of incompletion. Although sadly, on that point of view, North Hearts has actually adopted its local plan recently, as I'm sure you're all aware with, a, from our point of view, inappropriate levels of development allocation on protected land. We're very clear that we are an interest group, but increasingly we're working with local groups, advising them on how they can respond, and often working jointly with them in combined objectors groups. And we've just finished a very large planning inquiry east of Tring, 1,400 units on the green belt, immediately adjacent to the children's area of outstanding natural beauty should never even have got to the stage of an application. But Red Row, the developers, bought the land. It wasn't even an option, which tells you something about the rather crazy state of land purchase and pressures that open land is under in this part of the world. Before Christmas, we appeared at the Luton Airport planning inquiry. Not the big one, not the development consent order that's just gone in that will double the size of it. This is one from 18 million to 19 million three inspectors, three Queen's councils, rows and rows of consultants, spent nearly a million quid. CPRE Hearts has one of two, um, what we call rule six objectors, spent 13,000 on a junior council. That's the imbalance that we're dealing with at the moment, and I could go on all night about that, but I won't. Again, more controversially perhaps, and this is where we get back to the topic to some extent. We were part of a combined objectors group of nine groups supporting Hartsmere boroughs refusal of permission at an appeal um, for developers for 60 hectare ground mounted solar generation installation and infrastructure in the green belt near Aldenham. And of course, I've no doubt we will return to issues surrounding that involvement. The point is that we are in the middle of the system by intention. And as my lawyer friend said, it can get a bit murky. In Hertfordshire, we look at about 18,000 applications a year with a team of dedicated volunteers. I'm looking straight at Davina here, who's one of them. And we respond to about 100, about two a week. So that's what we do for the countryside, as we see it, what actually is it? What is the object of our attention? When we come to talk about the countryside, perhaps it's easier to say what it isn't. It's not built up by which we mean that it's not mainly buildings like towns and cities. But then it gets a bit more complicated when we talk about villages, because they could be seen and often are described as rural, and we are certainly involved in rural life. That's part of our objectives and aims. Except that lots of villages are not rural anymore. They're mainly dormitories. For urban workers or the retired, rural workers are pretty well always in the minority. And that's certainly true in Hertfordshire. It's also true to say that the countryside, again, certainly in Hertfordshire, is largely artificial. Landscape formed originally by deforestation, farming, crossed by infrastructure of all sorts. Natural in the wilderness sense, it certainly ain't. 
not even in the middle of Stevenage. It's where I live. It's not even a wilderness there. But perhaps. And this is possibly where we start to diverge in terms of the debate about the future of the countryside. The countryside, arguably, was in some form of balance. It provided sustenance in the past to the, to the market towns, the cities that it served, that it was close to. It provided a level of social cohesion with rural communities. And you could generally get away from it all, not too far away, as urban dwellers, with all the physical and mental health benefits that the countryside brings. One of the main slogans for CPRE is access for all. And we've made great strides recently in promoting the benefits of the countryside to social groups and communities who are underrepresented in visitors to the countryside. In fact, it's no secret to say that some of our more traditional members have found that a little difficult to stomach. The classic lines of why are we spending scarce resources on diversity and inclusion campaigns when we should be concentrating on protecting what they are accessing. So back to what the countryside is and why does it need protecting and specifically in Hertfordshire. This really comes down in large part to protecting the green belt and parts of the Chilterns area of outstanding natural beauty. And for us, the starting point for countryside is open land, however degraded, which is not designated for any other use. And of course it is actually designated by local plans as countryside worth keeping as part of the statutory local plan process. The flippant point to make is that they're not making any more of it. And it's being used up for urban development. Of the 10 Hertfordshire districts, four are all effectively green belt outside the built up areas. Hartsmere, St Albans, Three Rivers, and Wayne Hatfield. Watford and Stevenage are urban, obviously. And the other four, including North Hearts, have very significant green belt and what is designated as rural area beyond the green belt, which is a local plan designation, designation to preserve rural character. Recent research by London Greenbelt Council, an umbrella grouping of local and specialist organisations, meets at the House of Commons. That's a very political group, and we're members of it. We contribute to their annual survey, and it showed that in 2020, 20,000 hectares of Greenbelt were allocated in local plans for housing and commercial development. Perhaps when you hear figures like that, you veer towards the thoughts of Sam Stafford, the newly appointed planning director of call themselves the Home Builders Federation as well these days as opposed to the House Builders, who until recently published a regular blog called Fifty Shades of Planning. I must admit I quite enjoy the title, but he's gone respectable, so of course he can't do it quite that way before he just puts out the same stuff from the HBF. His view, which he wrote about when he got his new job, is that the Green Belt is strangling the life out of planning, quote, he accepts that it's an understandable and popular policy. It's good enough to mention the CPRE called for a national policy which would establish clear and supportable criteria for designated protected land. And you may well have some sympathy with Sam's views or at least would temper his rather obvious developer's orientation to say that surely there is room for a more nuanced approach to allow some land to be released for housing or renewable energy generation. But he, of course, would like to junk the concept altogether. The main threat, as we see it, to the Green Belt is not, in our view, the concept itself, nor the need to junk its many benefits, but for increasing numbers of ill-thought-out, car-based and deeply banal speculative residential developments. These are promoted by volume house builders who quite legally game the planning process through appeals against the democratic wishes of local planning authorities, despite the statutory protections which ostensibly exist. Clearly, in any designation process, there is room for some re review and amendment. Greenbelt land, and Greenbelt land has definitely become degraded in many areas, and quite a lot of South Hertfordshire particularly, um, as examples. Unauthorized developments of all kinds takes place, and I'm sure we're all aware of our own examples. And planning enforcement as a discretionary activity has taken a huge hit
from austerity and in real terms, spending on planning departments in local authorities has reduced by 43% since 2010. And enforcement teams have taken a hit. There are three or four boroughs in this county that have no planning enforcement officers at all. Unsurprisingly, though, I take issue with Mr. Stafford's analysis, which doubts the efficacy of a designation which identifies intrinsic value in the countryside. And he suggests, at best, a significant weakening of present designations to consideration of green <coughs> wedges or green fingers because we need more land for housing. Just to stick with housing for a moment, and I will get off it in a second, Ignoring the fact that actual housing supply and delivery has very little to do with local authorities these days and that there are well over a million residential units consented and unimplemented according to the Local Governments Association, this approach runs a coach and horses through the credibility of the local plan system. If councils can ignore their own planning rules to permit development on the green belt, why should anyone else take any notice of planning legislation? Protection doesn't mean protection for designated protected land like national parks, areas of outstanding natural beauty, and the green belt. One may ask, what is its purpose? So to jump straight into the pot, we believe that the same sort of arguments about protection go for renewable energy generation by ground-mounted solar panels. Solar panels are clearly development. That's why they need planning permission. But they're not locationally constrained, so why put them in protected areas, said simply. The sun shines everywhere on the righteous and the unrighteous, godly and the ungodly. And on sept in September the 21st, the solar trade organization itself came up with a figure of a quarter of a million hectares of roofs which could accommodate panels. That's their trade organization said that. This is a fast moving area, obviously, and a major campaign for national CPRE for rooftop generation, the promotion of rooftop generation, and one only has to see the endless rows of new warehouses along the A1, Milton Keynes, and you know, you name it, throughout the country, um, intuitively to see the potential, let alone domestic generation. Also, arguments related to food production. I was most interested in what Richard said about that, and security, of course. And the efficiency of panels and means of production and so on. I think those are issues that can be overcome um, in time with research. But in the end, I believe the most telling reason for protecting the countryside lies in the intrinsic value of the countryside itself. And this should be reflected very specifically in planning decisions. And at the moment, it isn't. Its roles in carbon sequestration and biodiversity net gain are not quantified at present. And there's a crying need for so much more research across the board into the balances which need to be struck between the varying priorities to tackle climate change. It's also a truism now, I think, to say that the pandemic emphasized the value of what is nearest to us. People walked, cycled, took the bus or train as well as drove to their nearest countryside where they could, and in many cases discovered all kinds of places they didn't even know about previously. They walked around fields they'd never even noticed before. There is an argument that says that protecting land, as in the Green Belt, means that only rich people get the benefit. But I think that runs into the buffers pretty quickly, if only for a start, to say that development at the edge means people have to travel further to experience the mental and physical health benefits, which the countryside undoubtedly brings. Our view is that for the most basic human reasons, we need the countryside, and we're living <coughs> it for the wrong reasons. There may be some glimmers of hope in the amendments proposed by the National Planning MPPF, National Planning Policy Framework, amendments that have just finished their public consultation round. But one can take a view as to whether this government has either the capacity or the willingness to take on any kind of environmental agenda 
given their industry support and one or two other items that they appear to have on their plate at the moment. So in conclusion, it's clear that the arguments that relate to the use of countryside for energy generation, whether solar panels or wind turbines, are more nuanced than for housing or film studios, for instance. And we recognize that at CPR Hubs. The issue is where you draw the line. And our starting point is quite clearly designated protected land. Applications for 30 to 45, 35 to 40 years, which are the standard for solar panel installations, of which there are now 10 throughout the county, of between 50 and 100 hectares, they can hardly be regarded as temporary, although that is how they are promoted. It's not for us to delve into the financial and institutional structures of the promoting companies, the methods of, of production, and so on. Others can do that a lot more effectively. Our arguments relate to the loss of highly, hugely valued landscapes, agricultural land, and open countryside, effectively, as far as we're concerned, permanently. Renewable energy is absolutely a global priority. My final remark, where it is generated locally requires a robust and complex process of balancing benefits and harms. And at present, we feel that in too many cases, the harms to protected countryside are not being considered sufficiently when it brings so many benefits to so many, both rural and urban dwellers. Thanks very much, Chris. Don't sit down. <laughs> <laughs> well, only for a moment. Um, I'm sure there are some questions. Uh, I have a quick yeah. clarification on something you said. So uh, you, I think you said 20,000 hectares was lost every year, was that right? Yes, yes, that's, yes. So that's the same as eight Stevenages every year? Yes. Thank you. Uh, is that nationally or in Hertfordshire? That's the state of the Greenbelt, but yes, it is 20,000. I'll have the microphone. <laughs> I'm, I'm very careful when people ask questions like this because you have to be absolutely... Um, Quite. No, I'm being, I'm being very careful. Where was it? Because I did make a reference to it. Yes, there we go. It's the London, the London Green Belt Council. Who, who, so who, just around London. And so that the is rate just of... the London Green Belt. In 2020, 20,000 hectares of Green Belt allocated in local plans. So that means that there is a presumption that the development can go ahead um, for housing and commercial development. And that happens to be eight times the size of And that happens Stevens. to be given the areas of the urban areas, yes. Yeah. So, any questions? Oh, well. I've got, uh, I've got a couple of questions. <laughs> so um, I was interested, uh, I mean, the, the, it's a, a great talk, really good, thank you. And um, two, two questions that, that sort of run one into the other. The first is that um, how much do you think, uh, I mean, you did at the end touch on uh, biodiversity, biodiversity loss, and uh, ecosystem services. Um, but it, it, I've long thought, and this is not to undermine CPRE, for which I have a huge amount of respect and, and I think does a really good job, but it, a lot of its work is based around visual interpretation of landscape. Um, and really, as you said at the end, uh, there is so much more to it than that. Um, and the other question, is really around the fact it's a, it's of particular relevance to us in Hertfordshire Greenbelt, but um, the, the main thrust of what you were saying was that we should keep development off Greenbelt, which I completely agree with. But what about um, uh, photovoltaics or agrovoltaics 
outside those areas. Um, so your, your, the title of your talk was Countryside Worth Protecting, but, but it felt to me that the thrust of it was Greenbelt Worth Protecting. <laughs> and that's absolutely right. It is exactly that, because I think the arguments for solar generation and so on are more nuanced than for housing developments and film studios and large warehouses and so on. Um, we accept that the renewable energy objective, the renewable energy imperative, um, is a huge driver of, of policy at the moment and needs to be. Um, our starting point, and keeping it in a very complex situation, keeping it as simple as we can, the fact that there is designated protected land that has been so designated as the result of a very lengthy process of local plan preparation that includes the, the, uh, the local authorities and the local groups through several rounds of consultation, etc., etc., comes up with land that is felt to be worthy of protection. That's our starting point. Um, the difficulty, of course, in Hertfordshire, and which is why planning appeals have been won and why um, decisions are made to go ahead with, 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 with development on Greenbelt, is that a lot of the boroughs are mainly Greenbelt. So if it doesn't go there, where does it go? And you then get into looking at how you develop the calculations of housing need, which are based on out-of-date figures, on out-of-date population and household projections, etc., etc. The figures are not as big as they need to be, but there is this sort of perfect storm of institutional finance and developers and so on who are willing to use the information that they get to make the proposals that, that, that they do. It is a very complex area, and we are trying to simplify it to a certain extent to say we've been through quite a big process to get to a local plan, and that is designated protected land, and that is our starting point. It can be reviewed through the local plan process, and in fact it is, and East Hearts is starting its review, and it's going to be fascinating to see what happens there, because a Green Party, um, dare I say, um, is the largest group, 19 councillors in East Hearts, a complete change of political direction, and a review of the local plan there is going to have I think huge implications, um, not only for East Hearts, but for the county as a whole as to how that, if you like, that objective, that, that, um, so when, that challenge, that, that challenge when a place is very largely protected, um, how that can be dealt with. No easy answers, but certain things we think are just inviolate, and that is to say the permanence of the green belt until it is reviewed by the process is our starting point. Yes, and visually, we, we're also alive to the fact that agricultural land um, may not be very biodiverse, dare I say, um, that certain, um, you know, certain, certain of the big, the, <coughs> the big fields, we, we tend to say valued landscapes and rural activities are our priorities. So those are the things that we sort of, if you like, start our arguments on. I was wondering if we could bring the conversation down to something that's happening today. For instance, by grade has got a large solar farm being proposed on first-class agricultural land. What's your opinion of that, Patrick? You said. So, sorry, which one? Sorry. sorry? My name which is Peter Hart. Yes, Bygrave. Yes, and it's all the best and most versatile, isn't it? That one, if I remember rightly. It's, 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 it's all grade two and three A, isn't it? Yes. Yes, That's, uh, and, and we would... We would say on, on both the basis of statutory protection and the fact that it is productive agricultural land, we would start off by saying that that is worth protecting as it is, as open countryside. 
So where has it got to? I'm trying to remember which one. When we've got ten, it's just difficult to remember yeah, what exact it's states between that Between Bygrave and Ashwell. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I would have to look it up, sir. I'd have to look it up. Sorry, I know two or three of them. Little, Little Bushy Heath and uh, West Wellin. No, I can't. I can't immediately okay. bring to mind. Sorry, I apologise. That, but I'll, I, I can look it up. We can have a word afterwards, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll check where it is in the process. We do respond to all of them, actually. Hi, uh, my name's Nick Hooper. I'm a, just a local resident. I happen to work on a farm, although I'm not a farmer by trade. Uh, I want to ask possibly a slightly provocative question, but just to put this in a wider context. Sometimes in my own kind of thought streams, I kind of model the uh, climate emergency as being it's almost like a war for our survival, um, the survival of our civilization and possibly our species. That we're already taking significant casualties in, and uh, it's obviously going to ramp up quite a lot in the next couple of decades. Given that situation, I just wondered if you were aware of um, the last time we perceived our civilization to be under attack, whether or not there were many objections to planning applications for gun emplacements that were built on the Kent coast. Just want to give some. You know, that's the kind of situation we're going to be in shortly. And I, I'm really interested to learn you know, about how these processes work, the kind of technologies we might employ and deploy uh, in order to alleviate the situation. But it just feels to me like the, the tone of the conversation needs to, needs to just get a little bit more serious than just talking about nuance and, and uh, uh, process. I would without hesitation, say that nuance isn't irrelevant. Um, I think actually it's quite important that we understand the complexities and entirely accept that there were huge objections to canal building and railway building um, and, and, and massive, um, the massive disruption that that caused to the countryside. So I take your point entirely. Um, and I think that's where we get back to the complexity of the balancing and the um, the need to have a robust process of being able to make the decisions. Perhaps you'd like to say something on that. So, uh, I think I've got my microphone on. Yeah, so firstly, that's a wonderful question, very, very interestingly phrased. Um, and I think it's such a fantastic point because the challenges that we're facing are in the future, they're big challenges, and sometimes some people may say we're not really feeling them ourselves today, but even if we're not, we will do. Flooding is forecast to increase a huge amount. So if there is, let's say hypothetically, you know, absolute rejection of, of solar parks and renewable energy, then we're going to see even more flooding. If we reduce the number of solar parks and, 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 and uh, wind turbines that we're putting in, um, then we're, we're going to see increases in flooding. So basically, more flooding is going to happen but the amount that that happens is, is related to climate change. And so, yes, we want to protect our countryside, but we also need to protect villages from being flooded. So we need renewable energy to, to, re to reduce those impacts. And this is why I keep saying it's very complicated and it's very challenging. And there's almost like close proximity, short-term objectives versus further in the future, um, long-term nationwide challenges that we're going to be facing um, and I, I really think we need to be massively uh, increasing our renewable energy capacity while also decreasing our energy consumption and um, that's what we need to be doing and while I agree that nuance is important um, where's this going to be in, in, in 50 years what's it going to be like and I know this is people often say like what, what's it going to be like for our grandchildren but it's, it's, it's a case of issues like flooding, like drought affecting food production is going to increase massively. So we do need to be addressing <coughs> that seriously. We, we ran out of time earlier in uh, questions for Richard. So if there are questions for either speaker, uh, we've got about 10 minutes left till we have to wrap up. So uh, lady at the front here. Hi, I, I've just uh, 
thoroughly enjoy walking and have probably walked most of the footpaths in and around Hitchin, etc., and, and beyond, and over the country. Um, so the countryside is obviously. Oh, sorry. The countryside is very important to me. Having said that, I um, I was up in Cumbria, uh, walking the coast there last summer, and the number of wind farms out to sea there were just like mind-boggling, hundreds. So I'd never seen so many turbines. So I kind of was accepting that and this business with where we get fuel from, etc. So I thought, well, maybe we have to pay the price. We need to have solar farms, and we don't like it, but the alternative is worse. But then somebody said to me, and I don't know if you can answer this, Richard, it's not come up at all, that and it was in relation to the development that's been under discussion here, the, local, the big local one, um, was that the batteries within these solar panels actually leak and poison the soil. And I just wonder how much truth is there in that? Saying it could sort of wipe the soil out for generations, which doesn't seem to go with what you've been showing at all, which I think look quite promising. So I wonder if you can say anything on that. Yeah, sure. So if it, it's one thing just for a clarification on the, the batteries, um, the batteries will be a separate unit that's stored near the solar park. Um, and if the batteries are leaching, say, heavy metals or, or other um, pollutants into the soil. Again, that's an engineering problem, and they should be designed so that they don't do that. Um, soil is so incredibly important. It underpins so much of us surviving as a, as a, as a species, as we say. Um, and so uh, we do need to be protecting soil, and absolutely what we don't want to be doing is, is, is leaching pollutants into it. Um, and if that's a problem, I would say that it's an engineering problem that needs to be researched and solved. So, uh, yeah, we do need solar panels, like you say, because we need the renewable energy, but we shouldn't be harming the environment. And, um, or at least we need to be harming it, like I said earlier, with the least negative um, as sure. we can. Um, and so if there is an issue with, say, heavy metals leaching into soil, that needs to be addressed from an engineering perspective. That's, that's what I would say for that, um, in terms of whether they actually are or not, uh, I'm, I'm not, I can't answer whether, whether that's the case for all, all, all batteries, but I, don't, I wouldn't have thought so. And could, could you just, sorry, just as a quick follow-up, the comment that was made about these solar farms always being near some kind of um, grid or mm -hmm. building, how important is it, you know, we have got lots of countryside, does that mean you have to have a whole separate infrastructure in order to actually take the energy that's produced to somewhere where you can use it? Yeah, that's, that's a wonderful question. So there is a slight loss of transmission. So if you have the um, electricity generation further away, you do have a slight loss of transmission. Um, but the main issue is, is cost, and I would say that's essentially it. And in fact, it was a question earlier, why are we building this right around a nice historic village when there's plenty of flat agricultural land, large fields of mono, monocrop far away from, from, uh, it, from communities? Why are we developing there? It's purely for a cost. Now, bear with me for the whole part of what I'm about to say. So you, would, you could say that if we were to then add that cost to the infrastructure, that's a cost, like you say, that we have to pay. Um, because energy bills will go up, except that does then raise the question of, is that really the case when we look at the profits that energy companies have been facing? Um, I did say I'm not going to get political. I might be getting a little bit political. But that's my thoughts on that, is that they will be more expensive to develop. Um, who should be paying for that? I'll leave it, I'll leave it there, but that's the, that's the main, main challenge. Thank you. And if I can just add a little... Um, wrinkled that as far as, I'm, as far as we're concerned, it's putting the countryside into the, into the equation, because at the moment it isn't. There aren't costs, uh, if you like, assigned to loss of countryside. And it really is a loss. And, and that, you know, when we do cost, cost and benefits as a, sort of, as, a, as, a, as a robust and complex process, our call is to say, make sure that the countryside 
and its benefits are part of that calculation because at the moment we feel that many times they're not taken into account. Yes. Well, we have time for one last question, unless it's a very brief point. Then, yeah, I just wanted to say that also when we're looking at from an economic perspective, they can be costed as well. You can, if, yeah, if you need to for your model, if that's the approach you're yeah. taking, you can say what is the economic value to having a walk in the open countryside. And currently, that's not been quantified enough to its, what I would say is its actual value. Um, this might be a really controversial note to end on um, for my friend at CPRE, so sorry about this. But um, would CPRE have uh, a view on a preference for if, if there was some land near a, um, a village in a rural community and it was slated to be built on by a developer, if they were saying we're going to build 100 new homes in this space that's you know, suitable for 20, or, or a solar park. <laughs> yeah, it's classic. The classic. The classic. The classic. The classic. The classic. Yes. Because I know personally, I would think the solar one is not going to come with noise. It's the, not going to come with cars. Of course, all and, of those things. And on the harms, and on the harms, yes, of course. Um, I would be. It, it would be very foolish of me to say that there is a, you know, a binary answer to that question because there isn't. And it's the, it's the local circumstances in each case that are so crucial to the en 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 enjoyment of the countryside. Um, and that's for both residents and visitors, obviously. Um, and that needs to be part of the equation. So yes, they you know, vary towards the, the energy generation, of course. But in the end, there still has to be value for countryside that is re recognized as such. And perhaps the uh, agrovoltaics would be better still. Than, uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> that. Okay, so that we, thanks to both thanks to both thanks to both our speakers. Fantastic, both of them actually, and I learned a lot um, from from both of you. And uh, I just wanted to thank the Green Party for staging this. Uh,